Um, thank you all for joining today. Um, it's like March 8, um, Red Sari Seminar Series. Um, it's my real pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Um, Rosie Tassil. Um, she's an MD, I have AHA, SEC, a cardiologist. Um, so it's very interesting, um, you know, how um, Rosie got today's presentation. Um, so a few weeks ago, I got an email from her um, saying like, um, she caught us online, she found our um, organization, and then she got expressed very interest to start a chapter in New York. And I was very thrilled by seeing, you know, again, these are very rare emails uh, I get time to time. Um, so I was very thrilled to see such a interest and the request. Um, so then I got, uh, we set up a Zoom call, we um, introduced ourselves and then learned, and then I invited her to come and present uh, with our team today. Um, so um, Dr. Um, Tassel has very uh, extraordinary um, track record in her career. Um, you see here that um, her uh, pre-college studies were at Cornell University. She went to pre-med uh, to Penn State University undergraduate and then went to uh, Thomas Jefferson for her MD. Um, then uh, she went to Mount Sinai for her cardiology fellowship and then uh, started her independent uh, assistant professor job at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Um, then recently, two years ago, she moved to uh, Jacoboy Medical Center. Uh, this is again in New York, uh, where she is now Associate Director of Cardiac Inter Intensive Care Unit. Um, and very interestingly, uh, she is also runs a an, an nonprofit organization and the founder of a, a name called Tassil MD. Um, probably she will explain to us what does that mean today. Um, on the outside, um, I don't know whether you guys had a chance to visit her website. Uh, she's very passionate in uh, training um, the students um, outside of her work um, and always very active in uh, promoting women in medicine um, and also the, all the uh, leadership trainings. So uh, very excited to have her today. And so she's going to talk today on uh, the title called Matters of the Heart. Um, so again, the talk will be for 25 to 30 minutes um, and then it will be open for question and answers. Uh, so for now, uh, please mute your microphone and listen to her talk. Um, and, and then after her presentation, uh, we can open up uh, for question and answers. And without any further ado, I would like to invite now uh, Dr. Rosie uh, Tassel to present the matters of the heart. Sakti, thank you for that beautiful introduction. That was uh, truly beautiful. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Rosie. I am a cardiologist practicing in New York City. And, you know, uh, February, as you may have known, is uh, is typically heart month, cardiovascular care month. Um, so we're a little bit late to that, but I think it's never a bad time to talk about heart health because it's, it's a pandemic in and of itself um, around the world and particularly within the South Asian community. So today for the, you know, the next 20, 25, 30 minutes, I wanted to talk about just some things we can do, you know, lifestyle things we can do um, within the context of our South Asian culture, um, in terms of improving our, our future health and preventing heart disease. Um, and I'll go over a little bit about the statistics of heart disease as well in, in, in the beginning. So without further ado, I do want to just put this out there that none of this is obviously medical advice. Um, if you have any very specific questions pertaining to your situation, then obviously you always want to seek health. Uh, help from your personal doctor. Um, so just to start, you know, heart disease, it's, uh, it's the pandemic that was already there before this pandemic, right? It's, it's the number one killer globally of, of people. 17.9 uh, million lives are taken each year from heart disease, uh, more than cancer, more than TB, more than tropical diseases, number one killer across the world. 
In the United States, it's also the number one killer for men, women, almost every racial and ethnic group, Asians, whites, blacks, you name it. Um, one in four deaths is from cardiovascular disease. Um, every 36 seconds in this country, somebody dies from heart disease. Um, and when I say heart disease, I'm encompassing all of cardiovascular disease, meaning heart attack, stroke, any disease of the, the arteries in the heart, uh, arteries in the body. Um, interestingly enough, when you look at the literature, about 80% of cardiovascular events can actually be prevented. And so what that suggests is that the bulk of heart disease and vascular disease is related to our lifestyle cho choices. Um, certainly genetics are a factor and there's some you know, immutable things in our lives, but for the most part, many cardiovascular events can actually be prevented, which is interesting. When we look at South Asians specifically, you know, it's interesting because we are 25% of the world's population, but we are 60% of the world's heart disease patients. So that's, that's crazy. The majority of the world's heart disease patients are of South Asian origin. Um, so that includes Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, uh, Sri Lankans, um, people from Maldives, um, and probably missing a few countries. But that entire subcontinent, we make up 60% of uh, the world's heart disease patients. And you know, why is that? You know, it's likely a mix of a few different things, genetics, you can't, you can't change that. Um, cultural um, and lifestyle influences. Um, back in 2006, um, there was a study that was started by several uh, institutions in the US called the Masala study, uh, very nicely named, but um, it stands for mediators of atherosclerosis in South Asians living in the USA. So what they tried to do was started to look at why is it that South Asians and those of South Asians de descent have such high incidence of heart disease? Um, one of the things they found is that we culturally, we as a subcontinent have increased incidence of diabetes and high blood pressure. And we also tend to develop diabetes and high blood pressure, even when we are normal weight. So whereas in the white population, for example, people tend to be of higher BMI, higher weight, and they develop diabetes. In South Asian population, you could be normal weight and still develop diabetes. And probably this is mediated by genetics. So this was from 2018, and this was a study that the American Heart Association actually conducted, and they found that uh, South Asians are more likely um, to, I'm sorry, I'm going to just move this one second. They're more likely to die of heart disease than any other Asian American population in the U.S., so Chinese Americans, Taiwanese Americans, Japanese Americans. When you look at all the other Asian American um, populations, South Asian Americans are actually more likely to die of heart disease, and certainly they're more likely to die than white Americans as well. Um, diabetes is a big mediating factor here. The other thing is also visceral fat. You know, as you've probably noticed, you know, South Asians, we tend to carry our fat in our belly, right? in our, in our you know, central area. And that is actually independently associated with insulin resistance. It's independently associated with heart disease. So unfortunately, that's the hardest kind of fat to kind of get rid of. Um, and a lot of it will come down to diet and genetics. Um, the other interesting thing that they found in this study is that South Asians and those of South Asian descent are less physically active than other ethnic groups. And this is really interesting, you know, and, and I, I can't exactly figure out why, except to say that maybe it's cultural. Um, you know, growing up, I went to India a lot. And uh, one thing that, you know, I would get asked from time to time, you know, is, you know, I would go for a run or do something. And, and my aunties and uncles would ask, oh, you're so skinny. Why you're so slim? Why are you running? You know, I think there's this, this mentality that it's for vanity or so, you know, you can be marriageable or whatever the case may be, right? So I think the mentality of going to the gym or staying active to protect your health, maybe it's not as culturally ingrained for us. Um, I know even for my parents, it was not. And that's something I had to change. So maybe it's somewhat cultural, but definitely staying active is important. Um, I think it's also difficult because, you know, we live in a, a time of screens. We have TVs, we have iPads, we have iPhones, you know, there's less inclination to kind of get up and, and get active. And with pandemic, it got even worse because now we're always on Zoom calls and that kind of thing. But it's so important to kind of get up and get get active. 
So when I talk about heart disease, you know, it's really a range of things. It's not just heart attacks, but it's also when the heart doesn't pump properly. It's also when the heart doesn't beat properly. So when we think of heart disease, it's not just, you know, somebody clutching their chest, having a heart attack. It's really a range of conditions that we see. And these are the things we really want to prevent ultimately. So when we think about risk factors, these are kind of the big ones. So diabetes, certainly high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, family history, um, and weight, being obese or being overweight is certainly a risk factor. So I think these are roughly the things that you should know about yourself. You know, you should know your weight, you should know your blood sugar, you should know your blood pressure, you should know your cholesterol and your family history if you can find out. So these are just things you should, you know, kind of every year when you go to the doctor, when you go to your primary care doctor, definitely these things keep tabs on. So these are some alarm symptoms, you know, when we have heart disease, and especially if you're having a heart attack, these are symptoms you definitely do not want to ignore. Um, chest discomfort, chest pain is the most common one that is, you know, always seen on TV where you see somebody clutching their chest and having a heart attack. Um, but the truth is, it's not always like that. Uh, sometimes people have heart disease, and they may have other symptoms like nausea, they may have pain in their left arm or their left part of the jaw. Um, they may have cough or sweating, um, swelling in the legs, difficulty breathing. All of these are important symptoms that you, do, you never want to ignore. Um, if you have any of these, you definitely want to talk to your doctor and figure out, is it from the heart? Is it from something else? Um, but chest discomfort in particular, you'd never want to ignore. Even if, it, even if you think it's nothing, maybe it's just a massive reflux. If you have any question or concern, it's definitely worth checking out. I wanted to include this slide here because uh, women are, are a little bit different than men when it comes to heart disease. And this is something we've really over the last few years started to research and started to figure out. But, you know, men, you know, when they have heart problems, they often do have the classic chest pain and difficulty breathing. Women, it's, it, they're often different. They will sometimes not have the chest pain, but they'll have indigestion or just feel tired. Um, you know, I, I've been in New York for now four or five years, and I used to, um, part of my training was in Queens, where I saw a lot of Bangladeshi women. And um, a lot of times when they were having heart attacks, all they would feel is just tired. They wouldn't have the classic chest pain. So I think particularly for the women on the call, you know, never ignore your symptoms, even if it's not chest pain, even if it's nausea or vomiting or feeling just more tired than usual, um, you know, definitely don't ignore it. Just keep tabs on your body and something seems off, definitely investigate. So what can we do ultimately to prevent heart disease, right? We said 80% of heart disease is intimately related to our lifestyle. So the, this means that we can prevent a good, good bulk of it. Um, as they say, an ounce of prevention is a, is worth a pound of intervention, right? Preventing things is always easier than treating things later. So let's talk about diet. I think this is a, a topic where I think we as South Asians have work to do. Um, and I think it's very, very difficult because food is so ingrained in our culture from a young age, from, you know, it, it, food brings back nostalgic memories. So I think it's very hard to change food habits. Um, but ideally, we should be eating a balanced diet that emphasizes fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, and, and high in fiber. So not white rice, white flour, those things are refined grains. So you want to eat whole grains. So things like um, brown rice, millet, steel cut oats, those kinds of things are low glycemic index and high fiber. Um, low fat dairy products or minimal dairy products for those that are not vegetarian, lean poultry and fish. Um, nuts and legumes, beans, chickpeas, those things are very healthy. Um, you want to avoid saturated fat, trans fat, salt, right? You want to try to avoid adding salt to, to food. I think that's a difficult one because I think we associate salt with taste. Um, but if you can keep it to less than two grams a day, that's ideal. Red meats, sweets, and sugary beverages. All of these you want to eat in moderation. And ideally, your plate looks like this on the right. It's colorful. It has lots of green, red, orange, yellow, um, a little bit of whole grains, and a little bit of lean meat. Um, unfortunately, this isn't always what our South Asian, you know, plate looks like, right? I think we tend to eat, um, 
you know, in my family growing up, we ate like, you know, we'd eat rice multiple times a day. And oftentimes we would, you know, I used to ask my mom, I'm not like, why, why do you, why do we have 80% of my plate is rice, you know, and then 20% is curry and some fish and things, but really it should be the other way around, right? We shouldn't be eating that many carbs in one sitting. And over the years, I've, I've tried to change that with my parents. And now we have like 30, 40% of the plate is rice and the rest is, you know, curry and carbs, uh, curry and fish and other things. But that took a while to change, you know, because they had grown up eating that. And it was uh, oh, it really, it took like a decade to change. Um, but I think, like I said, it, a lot of these things are so culturally ingrained, it's very, very difficult to change. Um, the thing with the South Asian diet is that we tend to have a diet that's high in carbohydrates and fat. Um, so if you think about some of the most tasty Indian and or uh, South Asian foods, excuse me, um, it's really like the samosas, the pakoras, the rasmalai, all of these things that we enjoy eating are quite unhealthy. Um, many of these are fried, right? With the samosas, the pakoras, the vadas, the puri, all of that is, is fried. It's high in carbs, high in fats, often fried in oil. Um, the sweets also, the rasmalai, the gulab jamun, the cakes, the barfi, all of that is is, you know, very high in sugar, um, usually grams and grams of sugar. So once in a while, these things are good, but, you know, you don't want to be eating them every day. And like I mentioned before, carbohydrate consumption, like our proportions, right? We tend to eat a lot of carbs in our diet. Um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, many South Asians are vegetarians, but what ends up happening is that oftentimes we substitute sugar car and carbs for not eating meat. So that doesn't make it healthier, right? So ultimately, you want to eat lots of, you know, kind of fruits and vegetables, colorful plate, um, and kind of minimize refined carbs and sweets and fried foods. Um, food is embedded in our culture, like I said, and you know, the other interesting thing is that, you know, South Asian diets can be quite unhealthy. And then, you know, when you combine that with the Western diet of pizza and hot dogs and all of those things, that ends up to, it being a very unhealthy combination. So, you know, diet is very difficult to change. And it's not something you can change overnight. I think you can make small, small steps. Um, and you can't deprive yourself, you still have to enjoy things and, you know, weddings and festivals and things. So it's, it's, it's good to do things in moderation. But overall, I think once you start, you know, decreasing the amount of rice you eat, de decreasing the amount of flour you use, things like that, over time, those things become habits. Exercise. Um, so I think exercise has become, you know, very difficult over the last year as a result of pandemic and work from home life. It's really quite made us sedentary. Um, and like I said before, you know, for whatever reason, South Asians more than other ethnicities are um, less likely to exercise. And I'm not sure what that is. Um, but exercise has so many great benefits. It decreases blood pressure, decreases your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol. It's shown to lower blood sugar levels, improve sleep and mood, and obviously um, help with weight management as well. So if you can get, you know, just 15, 20 minutes of some sort of aerobic exercise per day, that will make all the difference. So the formal uh, advice from the American Heart Association is to get at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. This amounts to about 20 minutes per day. Um, and moderate intensity activity, are things like dancing, gardening, brisk walking, power walking, uh, water aerobics, slow biking, or 75 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity. So that would be swimming laps, you know, high intensity dancing, uh, playing tennis singles, cycling fast, jumping rope. So, you know, a combination of some of these activities that you enjoy is probably the best way to do it. Um, I think it's hard now because gyms are still some closed in some places. Some areas are still cold, like in the Northeast. So it's very difficult to do this, but even if you can just do 15, 20 minutes of something in your house or apartment, you know, that's, that counts, you know, it's, it's about the, the consistency over time that really matters and the habit building. Smoking. So, you know, interestingly, you know, the smoking rates among South Asians in the US is actually quite low. Uh, but in India and Pakistan, it's and other, you know, South Asian countries, it's it's still quite it's still prevalent. Um, one of three cardiovascular deaths in the world is attributed to smoking. 
Over time, all of the toxins, the nicotine, it damages and hardens the arteries of the heart as well as the rest of the body. So smokers are two to four times more likely to develop a heart attack or stroke. So I have patients that ask me, doc, I've smoked my entire life. What's the point of quitting now? I've already, you know, I'm already at high risk. Why should I quit now? But what's interesting is if you quit smoking within a year, your added risk, your rate of risk increase actually gets cut in half. So there's still value in quitting smoking, even if you've smoked for 40, 50 years, right? Because that cumulative damage is there but any further damage is mitigated. So even if, you know, you're thinking about it or, you know, you're on that last few cigarettes per day, there's such high value to quitting. It's, it's better than any drug I can prescribe or any medication I can put a patient on. So very, very important. Weight management. So one of three Americans is obese. And as we know, obesity is linked to heart problems, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and many other conditions. Um, what's interesting, like I mentioned before, is that South Asians in particular are more likely to develop diabetes at a normal weight. So even if we are not obese, we may still develop diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, that's one of the disparities that we have, and it's probably genetic. So body mass index, a normal body mass index is between 18.5 to 24.9, 25 to 29 is overweight and typically over 30 is considered obese. Interestingly, the World Health Organization recommends lower cutoffs for South Asians because for us, effectively, obese is actually over 27.5 and overweight is over 23 because like I mentioned before, we tend to develop these risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure at a lower body weight. So these cutoffs are actually lower for South Asian patients. Um, at that link there, you can actually find a calculator if you want to kind of just see where you where you fit. Um, but, you know, perhaps a better indicator for people of South Asian descent is actually waist circumference. Because like I mentioned before, we tend to hold our, our body fat, unfortunately, in our, in our bellies, um, which is associated with heart disease. Um, so for women, you want to keep the, the waist circumference less than 35 and less than 40 inches for men. So, you know, it's very daunting if you're, you know, overweight or obese to lose a lot of weight at once. Um, but even losing just a little bit of weight can actually improve your, your risk factors. So if you lose just 3% of your body weight, you can lower your blood sugar levels at even just with that small weight loss. If you lose 5 to 10% of your body weight, you can improve your blood pressure and your cholesterol. So let's say you weigh 180 pounds, even dropping just six pounds means you've already effectively reduced your risk of heart disease because you've improved your risk factors. So with weight loss, it's not about, you know, losing the 40 pounds all at once, even just little, little changes can actually help you improve your future um, prevent cardiac prevention. Stress. So I put this in because I think over the last year, there's been there's been so many things um, that have happened that have increased people's stress levels, you know, work from home and teaching the kids from home and financial stress, economic stress, what have you. And stress is certainly um, something that can affect our cardiovascular system. When we're stressed out, we release cortisol, which um, has many effects on the heart in terms of heart rate and how the heart functions. So I think it's very important to um, kind of relax, find balance in your life. Um, exercise is a great stress reliever. It releases uh, endorphins, which are mood boosters, um, meditation and yoga. Um, I, I think a lot of South Asians actually already practice this probably. Um, music, keeping a positive mindset. Um, if you have, you know, anxiety, depression, anything where you feel like you need professional help, there's never any shame in seeking help for mental health. Um, and certainly having a strong social support system now more than ever, I think is very important, um, because there are certainly many ups and downs in, uh, in a time like this. So in terms of specific medical conditions, I think these are just some few numbers to know, you know, blood pressure, you know, we'd like to tailor these goals to the individual patients typically, but 120 over 80 is a good overall kind of goal to have. Um, for some patients, we might have it a little bit higher or lower depending on your specific circumstance, but generally you don't want your blood pressure closer to 200, you want it closer to 120. Um, in terms of cholesterol, you want your bad cholesterol, which is the LDL to be less than 100. And then with diabetes, um, there's a three month number we check called a hemoglobin A1C, and we want this number to be less than seven. Um, 
Um, and these three factors are the three biggest factors in addition to smoking that can impact future heart disease. So it's, it's really good to kind of know these every year. Um, every year when you go to your doctor, just make sure these are numbers that you check on and keep tabs on. So just to summarize, you know, um, there are things we can't change like our genetics, right? There's nothing we can do about that. In my family, on my dad's side, practically everybody has heart attacks and strokes. There's nothing I can do about my genetics, but there are things I can change in my life. And these are kind of those things. Um, you know, I can keep an eye on my blood pressure, my cholesterol, my diabetes. Um, unfortunately, I don't have diabetes, but I do get my number checked every year, the weight, diet, physical activity and stress levels. So these are all things we, these are all, you know, changeable things we can, um, we can do in our life. Um, once again, if you have any symptoms at all that are concerning, never hesitate to go to the doctor. There's also now, you know, televisits, which make it easier um, because of pandemic. Um, know your numbers, know your family history, try to make healthy choices and stay active. Give up the cigarettes. It's just not worth it. Um, and one other thing is that, you know, what we've also noticed over this last year is that patients who have heart disease, pre-existing heart disease, and also risk factors like diabetes are, they do worse when they get COVID. So this is even more reason to stay healthy and kind of, you know, think about your future self uh, when you make lifestyle choices, because God forbid something like this happens, all you may have is your body and your immune system. So you want to be as healthy as possible. Um, depending on where you are, what state you're located in, you want to, you know, abide by the local public health measures like masks and social distancing, uh, using sanitizer and so forth. But certainly, you know, keeping your heart health in optimal condition is, is very important because almost any thing that happens medically, if you have underlying heart disease, you're almost always going to have a worse outcome. And these are just some great resources that I use fairly regularly, the American Heart Association website, the Mayo Clinic, also the CDC, if you have any kind of guideline related questions or numbers, uh, questions about numbers, about where your target blood pressure should be, et cetera, et cetera. These are kind of great, re reliable, reputable resources to go to. And um, this is just my contact information. If anybody ever wanted to send me a message or find my website, um, and that is it. So I can, I can take some questions. All right. All right. Thank you so much for uh, no such problem. a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you so much. Um, okay. So now uh, time for question and discussions. Um, if you have any questions uh, to uh, Dr. Thassel, please unmute yourself and you can ask directly. Um, so but I can get started uh, with uh, my question first. Um, so the Disparity, right? It's one of the things that now mm -hmm. AHA is like talking about it a lot, lot and lot. Do you see any, yeah. uh, among South Asians, do you see any disparities like um, based on the income or based on the education or based on the job like IT versus non-IT? Yeah. Um, having who has more number or like a disease, um, you know, severity or the treatment and not, not getting enough mm -hmm. treatment, those kind of things. Yeah, so it's a very good question. And I think socioeconomic status is a big factor. Right. Um, I don't have specific data to support this, but what can I will say is- please uh, stop I sharing the screen so that we can see the full screen? Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, good. That's better. Um, so, you know, when I used to work in Queens and I currently work in the Bronx, so there's a lot of kind of underserved, um, low socioeconomic status patients there of South Asian descent and otherwise. And um, interestingly, health outcomes tend to be worse there than in Ma Manhattan, where, pe you know, people tend to be a little bit more middle class and well to do. So, certainly, one of the big factors there is socioeconomic status. And I think that's yeah. mediated by health literacy because yeah. I, I find that health literacy. It tends to be lower yeah. with some of those populations. And, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of sitting with them and saying, hey, you shouldn't add ghee to everything you eat or, you know, you shouldn't, right. you know, like just kind of education. And they didn't grow up sometimes having that. Yeah. So it's um, it's definitely there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. OK. Um, anyone else? OK, um, so here is I'm Venkatesh. Uh, this is an excellent presentation, Dr. Tashil. Um, so it's a really great refresher course for us. So my question is like, 
I know, I know it's, it's really hard to follow the diet. I mean, uh, specifically among South Asians where we, um, when, for, for, especially for kids, we, you know, we, we always feed them a lot of carb and sweets mm-hmm. and the kids are very fond of all these things. So, so um, at what age, like actually we should like, you know, start uh, forcing, like, you know, enforcing this diet for, especially kids or like adults when, when they, Teens, but but what age like kind of a cutoff point? So that's yeah. that's Actually, one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's one question. I have an, another overlapping question. <laughs> uh, so this diet, do you think this would delay the cardiovascular, uh, you know, incidence, or uh, this would completely, you know, um, uh, what do you say, completely prevent, or it would delay? Mm-hmm. So that's my uh, second question. Yeah, so the first question, I think the answer is early as possible. Um, I think there's a lot of literature in this country that childhood obesity is actually becoming a problem as it is. Um, So even kids, you know, who are nine, 10 years old are overweight. Um, So, you know, the healthy choices should start as, as even when they're an infant, even when they're a child, right? You don't want to deprive a kid, obviously, but I think a lot of the habits you learn in childhood get carried over to adulthood. Um, and even me, like I find that, you know, a lot of the comfort foods I had in childhood is what I reach for as an adult. Yeah, so I think the early- regulations, right? Epigenetic regulations. Genetic what? Epigenetics. Epigenetics. Yeah, yeah. So um, certainly, I, I would start as early as possible. Certainly, I'm not a pediatrician. But you know, just from what I see on the adult side, you know, a lot of these things do these habits do start in childhood. Um, your second question about diet, um, we can't completely eradicate cardiac disease, right? There is a genetic component. But you know, just based on the literature, we should be able to get rid of 80%. So that means we would certainly delay some cardiac events. And then some events we would get rid of altogether. So even if if we got if we got rid of 80% just from lifestyle changes, that's quite a bit. So but your, the answer to your question is probably a little bit of both, we would certainly prevent some events, and we would probably delay some events as well. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah, so like, let's say what's, uh, um, let's once uh, started this diet and how, like, let's say someone want to uh, taste some kind of like, you know, uh, sweets or uh, their favorite food, which may not be uh, the the best one. So how do you advise? How frequently can we, not frequently, how can, uh, you know, what interval we can have our favorite unhealthy food? Yeah. So I think different people do this differently. Um, you know, the way I do it is, uh, and I tell myself I'll eat healthy six days a week. One day I'm allowed to cheat right? I'll eat healthy, maybe Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday will be my cheat day. And I'm allowed to indulge in my favorite foods that day. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to say, I can eat my favorite foods, but I can eat small quantities of it, right? So it may be instead of eating three balls of gulab jamun in one in one sitting, maybe you eat like a half of a, 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 a ball of gulab jam, right? Like it's it's not that you need to like cut everything out. It's just about portion control and eating in moderation. Yeah, that's that's highly impossible for me. It's a- <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's hard. It takes time. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, sounds good. All right. Uh, next, uh, I think Avishwa is unmuting himself. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Sarpi. Um, that was a great presentation, Dr. Tasho. Uh, I really appreciate your uh, presentation and your perspective as well. One of the things I, I heard you saying is about smoking. And you said mm-hmm. one, one third of the population of people who die with, in the, with cardiovascular disease is attributed to smoking. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking, and you also made a f- wonderful point, it is never too late. Even after several decades of smoking, it is still worth cutting uh, and stopping as much as possible. So I, I can understand people struggle with that, with quitting. What do you think, having seen so many patients, um, what, what more can we do for these people? And so that way we can, these are all preventable mortality, right? A lot of it is preventable, but what more can we do? And from a policy perspective and from a research perspective, and on the other hand, there are companies, you know, you know they are making profit by selling these, either it is nicotine or vaping or any of these products. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So, the electronic I, I cigarette, right? The electronic cigarette is very booming. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think the I think the best way to just kind of tackle that issue is to tackle kind of the teenagers and the college students, mm. because I think a lot of smokers, they pick it up when they're 12, 13, 14, 15, and then they can never quit. Right. So if you can, hit, you know, kind of um, target those people just as they're starting, whether it's e-cigarettes, vaping, nicotine cigarettes, whatever it is, I think if you can tar- have targeted policy for teenagers and college kids, I think you can kind of prevent the problem from even happening. Um, because once the addiction sets in, then it becomes a lifestyle thing and it's very difficult to change. But I think if you can target, you know, the 14, 15 year olds who are just picking up a cigarette for the first time, um, and some of that will be education in schools, you know, public campaigns, educate, you know, like even just going out into the community and educating young, young kids about the, you know, the, the, the ramifications of smoking or vaping. Um, I think that's really where you can kind of nip it in the bud because I think it's much harder once, you know, they're much older and they have already developed, uh, you know, kind of a habitual addiction. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I hope, I hope (laughs) there is some, some of these newer novel approaches that come to help this population. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I also see why uh, alcohol didn't come in your list. So I was wondering, um, Mm -hmm. it's not that bad as smoking. Yeah, so alcohol is definitely um, also has cardiac implications and actually can increase your risk of heart disease as well. Um, Certainly per day, two drinks for a man, one drink for a woman, any more than that can over a period of time, a period of years affect the heart. Um, It doesn't have the direct toxicity that nicotine obviously has. Um, So the burden of alcohol, you know, alcohol causing heart disease isn't quite as prominent as nicotine and cigarettes. But certainly we have, you know, lots of patients that I see that, you know, have have drank heavily for a period of years, and that affects their heart. So Alcohol in moderation is okay. Definitely, you know, you don't want to be drinking, you know, um, you know, multiple drinks a night and, you know, heavy liquor and things like that. But, you know, one, one to two drinks for a man and one drink for a, a woman per 24 hour period is okay. Okay. Right. That's what you want to hear, right, Linky? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now I have evidence. I, I, I have evidence. Hey, Lada has some question for you. Sure. Um, Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Thatcher. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, uh, I wanted to add on to my, my question um, to what Venkatesh had asked. He asked about, um, you know, encouraging kids to eat healthy and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, at what age do you recommend um, them getting like blood tests? You know, is it, is mm-hmm. it 20? Is it 25? Is it even before that? Yeah. So in general, you know, before 18, we don't do any of that kind of testing for cholesterol and for um, sugar and things like that. Once they're in their 20s, that's usually the time to get your first screening test. And I think for South Asians, we tend to have a lower threshold for testing a little bit earlier um, because of our our genetics. But definitely your 20s is the first time you should start getting screened, usually in your first half of your 20s, 21 through 25. Okay. Okay. And Thank then you. at that point, you would do like every three years or so. Right, right, right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Hey, anybody else? Otherwise, um, I really uh, want to... I, ha- I have a question. Yes, Charles. Uh, yeah, that's a great presentation, Dr. Thatchell. So how reliable are the readings, EKG readings from the Apple Watch? Hmm. Very good question. Uh, not very reliable. Um, <laughs> because uh, the reason I say that is because it's actually not giving you typically when we do an EKG, we actually have 12 leads. So we're getting a lot of data from different areas of the heart. And based on that, we can tell the rhythm, we can tell if there's a heart attack going on. There's a lot of data we can get from that. From the Apple Watch, it's very limited data from one or two spots. So it's, it's a, you know, you know, there are patients that have um, identified abnormal rhythms from it. Um, and there was the Apple I, the Apple Watch study that actually uh, came out a few years ago. So there's some utility to it. But as a medical diagnostic um, mechanism, as a screening mechanism, it's not so good. So my next question is because why I asked that one was because even the for children, the cardiologist mm-hmm. recommend 
kind of the i forgot the name you put your fingers and then it shows the you know the heart the ekg is again yeah that's similar to yeah. apple watch recommend it so how reliable that is yeah so i think you're talking about are you talking about cardium the cardium yeah. mobile one yeah, yeah so something. yeah i think that one is more reliable than the apple watch the problem with the apple watch is sometimes you, you know when you even take a tracing it actually sometimes even reads your heart rate wrong so it's not i wouldn't use it as a medical diagnostic tool you know if you have any questions what's nice is you can actually send that to your doctor like you can take a strip and send it to the doctor so they can take a look at it right. so you know i wouldn't i wouldn't like use that as like the end all be, be all you know the apple watch but you can use it to sort of guide yourself and if you're feeling something definitely check a, a tracing and then ask somebody to review it ask one of your doctors to review it thank you anyone else thomas dr thomas from loyola university of chicago Oh, great presentation, Dr. Tachal. So I just want to ask you regarding the uh, connection of uh, gut microbiome and the disease causation, the cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease causation. Do you have anything to highlight on that or? Yeah, that's like a, a burgeoning. Yeah, that's kind of a burgeoning uh, hot topic now, uh, gut health and cardiac health, really gut health and everything. Um, the, the short of it is that we don't have any guidelines right now. Um, there are people who are encouraging sort of plant-based diets because they feel that that will encourage a healthier gut biome and in turn, maybe that will help prevent disease of all sorts. But as of right now, there's really no kind of guidance or recommendation to say um, that, you know, gut biome is directly related to decreased cardiac events and things like that. You know, that's an area that's kind of still being researched. And so hopefully in the next few years, we'll have a little bit better guidance for that. Yeah, since you've touched on the diet, um, you know, I have a few students who submit uh, uh, their comprehensive examination paper in, uh, you know, topics like keto diet, plant-based mm -hmm. diet, and all different mm -hmm. forms of diets uh, to prevent cardiometabolic risk. risk. Yeah. So can you describe a little bit on keto diet? Because, you know, at times I wonder how this diet is... <laughs> you know, can have beneficial effect uh, and prevent some of those cardiometabolic complications. So I don't yeah, know, the students the are so much interested that. to study those. Yeah, the keto diet is very, very controversial. Um, it's, you know, it's had mixed, mixed reviews, right? Um, it's very rare to see a cardiologist actually actively recommend the keto diet because the keto diet actually encourages you to eat a lot of the fats that you really shouldn't be eating. <laughs> so um, the keto diet is, is very controversial. It's not something I would recommend. If I were to recommend a diet, it would be the Mediterranean diet um, because it tends to be kind of plant and, ve you know, vegetable heavy with lean meats and kind of, a, you know, the food pyramid, when we think about it, the Mediterranean diet does it the well, it does it the best in terms of proportions and all, having all of the different food groups. So a lot of these fad diets like keto diets and, you know, you know, cleanses and people don't eat for five weeks, things like all of those kinds of fad diets, I generally don't recommend, um, you know, in the future, maybe things will change and there'll be more literature around those. But really, as of right now, the Mediterranean diet is still kind of the go to that a lot of doctors recommend. Thank you. Um, following uh, Dr. Thomas' uh, question on the gut microbes and, you know, how we think. Um, so when, when, for example, when I see my, one of my favorite meal, like, a, you know, goat biryani, right? I smell it <laughs> so and I, you know, I, and my mind says, do not eat more than one plate, right? So I, I already prepared. I know I'm not going to eat more than one plate. I go and I start eating. Then I can't stop going for a second plate. What controls me? Is it my gut microbes controls me? Go for a second plate, or my mind <laughs> changed? Which one? I think it's so the pleasure centers in the brain get activated by food, right? So you know, 
anything that feeds that pleasure center, you're going to want to keep doing. Keep but the doing. idea is, you know, my mind over matter where you have to say, I'm full, I don't need to eat anymore. So I can right. stop, right? Yeah. That's, that's where you need to say, you know, it's very easy to overeat and to just keep eating because it tastes good. Right. But yes. at some point, you say, I'm full, I'm not hungry anymore. I don't need to eat it, you know? Yeah. But so it's tough. It's, it takes a lot of willpower. It's a very tough decision. It's like, yeah. you know, so yeah, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions to Dr. Thassan? Um, yes, I do. Um, uh, so, um, uh, Dr. Thatchell, you mentioned um, um, brown rice. Now, mm -hmm. us Keralites, we love our mata rice. Yes. So, how does how does the mata rice compare? Um, to when you're talking about mata rice, you're talking about the parboiled rice, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the parboiled rice, interestingly, the way it's processed, it actually tries to seal in some of the vitamins and nutrients. So it's better than eating the white rice, because um, mm -hmm. white rice, you know, is the most refined and processed, it actually has right. the least nutrients. So parboiled is actually better than that, but not quite as good as brown rice, okay, which is the least processed. Uh, the brown yeah. rice has still has its fiber intact. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I, I grew up eating lots of the, the mata rice, the parboiled rice. <laughs> but the brown rice takes more time to cook. It is harder to cook. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely harder to cook. It, it makes you full much faster. So then, you know, you can't eat that much more either. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good. Very Thank good. You. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, I do have yes. one. one. Yeah. Vishwa, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, also, I, I'm not sure if I missed this in your presentation. Um, do we know if any of the individual countries within the South Asian population more prone to cardiovascular disease than another um, among the South Asian countries or a, a specific uh, communities? Yeah, so we don't know that yet, but um, you know the tr the longitudinal study, the Masala study. Um, as they gather more data, we should have more country specific data with that. But as of right now, at least in the U.S., we don't really have kind of um, like ethnic specific data yet. But hopefully, in the future, we will. Thank you. Look forward to that. But it says that um, if you, there is no difference between vegetarian and non-vegetarian, right? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. That's the, um, well, 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 the interesting thing is that, you know, vegetarians often kind of substitute for meat with increased dairy and carbs. So yeah. that doesn't actually translate to being healthier. Okay. So yeah, you're right. In, in terms of the uh, overall outcomes, there's actually not much of a difference, but red meats you should stay away from, you know, like yeah. the, the, you know, the steaks and the, the veal and the goat also, you know, so. Yeah. Beef curry, I love beef curry. So yeah, it's uh, it's hard to stay away from that stuff, <laughs> but um, in moderation. In moderation, yeah. Questions, comments, anything to Doctor Tassel? We have eight more minutes to go. Hi, my name is Sneka. I'm from Alabama. First off, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing. Um, it's actually been a good while since I've joined one of these webinars because of, with school and everything because I'm a high school, I mean, I'm a high school junior. Uh, but yeah, I just, not, I don't have any questions, but it was really interesting to particularly like hear you talk about EKGs and such because I'm interested in going into the medical field and I've done a couple of my own EKG readings, but it was great to see like the cardiology aspects of it. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, good luck with everything. If you ever need any advice or any guidance, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Um, Sinara is very active, even, you know, she's now junior um, in high school. She attended several American Art Association meetings. Um, so she presented in some of those meetings as well. Um, very activist in, in promoting cardiovascular and health and promotions in Alabama. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. We need more young people that are kind of going into the community and kind of, you know, uh, yeah. getting involved. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any questions, comments? Uh, 
Um, hello, my name is Urchina Rajasekran. I'm Sneka's little sister. I'm a ninth grader in high school. Um, ninth grader, speak louder, please. Oh. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed your presentation. And at the end, when you're talking about like how even at a young age, you should stay away from like foods that have a lot of fat and sugar foods. Um, like I'll pay attention to that more because like, you know, I don't pay attention to what I eat. And like I eat a lot of chocolate and other sugar foods. But thank you so much for educating me on that. Of course. It was a great presentation. Of course, you're welcome. So um, because there is no one, I'm, I'm going to ask this stand-up question. I, we usually ask this one every time. Because you are coming from also ethnic from Kerala. What about the coconut oil? People talk all the mm. time, coconut oil, the benefits. Some, people, some group of people say it's beneficial, but some people say it's non-beneficial. Yeah, the data is mixed. Okay, wow. The data is mixed, yeah. Oh. So there's there's some um, there's some like you know you know spotty literature that's saying coconut oil is actually protective, and then there's yeah. other kind of um, other kind of literature saying that these vegetable oils are not healthy to be using anyway. You should only use olive oil, like mm. extra virgin olive oil. So the data yeah, yeah. is mixed. There's, the nice. jury's out on that one. Oh. Um, okay. Carolites will tell you it's healthy and it's fine, and they put coconut in everything. Yeah, well, All the Everything is coconut, um, but uh, but the data, the jury is out on that one. Uh -huh. I think if you're going for oil, the healthiest one you can use is generally an extra virgin olive oil. That's going to be your healthiest choice for oils. Yeah. Um, I do have to add that, um, you know, uh, I actually um, attended a webinar by um, uh, um, uh, another doctor where uh, he, he was, he actually did like a, um, I, he was not a cardiologist. I don't recall what he was, but he actually did like a, um, a, a cooking a demonstration also. But then what he did say is that uh, he, uh, uh, olive oil should not be heated at a high heat. And for, uh, uh, for Indian cooking, especially, you know, if you do, uh, if you want to do the um, uh, tadka or whatever, you know, yeah. a lot of times we use high heat. So they do actually say not to use olive oil on high heat because it actually breaks it down and um, you lose the health benefits. Right, so, it denatures it, I think. So I think you yeah. have to sort of keep it at close to what it normally is, the temperature that it, it comes in. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So my, my uh, solution to that is to just use like canola oil for the most part and just top it with a drop of coconut oil for the care life. <laughs> for the coconut taste yes <laughs> so what about just adding the just a coconut powder you know fresh coconut instead of oil that's more healthier mm -hmm. right eating coconut is healthier than the oil right so fresh any sort of fruit and vegetable the less processed it is the better yeah. so you know when you grind a fruit or vegetable even if you're making a smoothie or a powder you yeah. lose some of the health benefits so if you can eat it raw that's going to be your best bet anytime it gets processed or preservative or anything it becomes instantly less healthy yeah yeah no i agree with that yeah yeah if you can find fresh coconut that's that's that would be the best but it's difficult yeah the last point I would like to ask uh, uh, the comment is like, um, so we didn't cover the sleeping habits. How important, you know, the immigrants, first generation, we have this issue, you know, when we bring any sleep specialist, they get the most questions because, you know, um, yeah. you know, be an immigrant, you know, you come, you leave your country, you leave everything, you come here. And so most of the immigrants can't sleep eight or 12 hours per day. And so they, four to six hours or break yeah. in between, how that affect cardiovascular disease? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, ideally you should be getting seven to nine hours of sleep per day. Um, as you get older, the quality of your sleep generally decreases and the amount of sleep you can get in one, you know, sleep is actually less. But you should try to get seven to nine hours. Um, you know, sleep is often related to stress, um, oftentimes people who can't sleep are also highly stressed individuals. Yeah. Um, and sleep is also related to hormonal changes. Um, there are rhythms and hormones that change throughout our day and it's dependent on having good sleep hygiene. So over a period of time, you know, increased stress, 
poor sleep habits can certainly affect, you know, things like your cortisol levels and in, due to multiple mechanisms, it can, it can cause, you know, or contribute yeah. to heart disease, right. blood pressure, things like that. So it's very, very important. And I think it's, you know, with pandemic, I've noticed people are just not sleeping. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're sleeping in because it's work from home. And they also don't have that barrier between work and home, right? You don't, you yeah. don't have necessarily commute to work, you yeah. kind of roll off your bed and you're at work. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that's difficult. Um, the one thing that really helps with, um, with sleep is exercise. So if I'm, it, you know, if I work out for an hour or two, I'm so exhausted, I fall asleep and I sleep really well. Yeah. <laughs> so exercise yeah. is a great sleep booster and what about the daytime sleep um, people talk about the power nap like one o'clock power nap is ideal it's good for health yeah so less than 30 minutes um, is, is a good power nap anything more you're going to wake up groggier just yeah. because of how the sleep cycle works yeah. um, generally we have 90 minute sleep cycles oh, yeah. um, but you don't want to go that long because if you go to 90 minutes you'll be in deep sleep and then when you wake yeah. up you'll feel kind of groggy so 30 yeah. minutes or less yeah all right, it's nine o'clock. Um, so I'd like to end the close the session and I would like to thank our speaker, Rosie, Dr. Rosie Tassel. Thank you for taking your time, connecting uh, with us from New York. Um, we hope to communicate again, um, you know, starting a chapter in New York, Red Sari chapter. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, so we wish you all the best and have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And it was nice to meet all of you. Thank you.